Hey Java programmers, let's talk about arrays. So we have all this data. Most of the time, large groups of data are logically related, meaning you have 10 of the same thing, or 100 of the same thing, or a million of the same thing. It doesn't make sense to declare a million different variables to manage all of those things. One, it would be a lot of typing. Two, it's a great opportunity to make more mistakes. And three, the code would be incredibly long and difficult to understand. And four, variables would be coming and going all the time. It's more convenient to create one variable that has a whole bunch of values and a single name. We access those values by changing some numeric value called an index. And that works really, really well for us. So we find all kinds of different data structures built into the language that let us manipulate data by a common name and a an varying index. A good example of this is keeping track of the scores for each hole in a round of golf. I don't play golf. I've seen it on TV. I have played putt-putt, I guess. Miniature golf. In golf, you have up to 18 scores per round. Each score is the number of times you hit the ball to get it into a hole. Therefore, you need 18 integer values to track those 18 scores. And you'd need those values for everybody that's playing. Each person that's playing would have their own set of 18 scores. And we could create 18 different variables, as I did on the slide. Or I could create one variable and make it an array of 18 integer values and it only has one name. Right away, our program became 18 times simpler. And we can use looping constructs to step through this array to add up all the scores, or print all the scores, or save them to a file, or post them on a website. And an array, since we can loop through it with, since we can step through it with a loop allows us to create much more compact and understandable code. You're not going to see anybody creating 18 values that are logically related when they could just create one value and then make that into an array of 18. We create an array in two steps. I'm using the term create in a general sense. It breaks down into a part called declaration. You've already seen many variable declarations. And then the second part, which is new to us, is the instantiation step. Those two steps taken together could be considered creating an array. And we still refer to this as a variable. In the example on the slide, score is a variable of type array of integers. To be more specific, this one is an array of 18 integers. We can do the creation of the array, the declaration, and the instantiation in two steps or in one step. You need to learn both strategies because sometimes You'll declare it, then farther into the code, you'll instantiate it. Those two steps may not be together. In other situations, it may be appropriate to declare and instantiate at the same time and even combine those two steps into one statement. 
make sure then you can differentiate between declaration and instantiation and make sure you can do that in two steps or also do it in one step. I will demonstrate that in my code. I have Eclipse running. I hope. There it is. I'm going to create a new project. I will call this project Array Stuff. As normal, I will put a main class into my project. I will call the package main with a lowercase m and the class main with an uppercase m. I will ask Eclipse to create the main method. If you forget to create the main method, you can always type that in by hand. Not a problem. Just not something that I want to do. Get rid of that little to-do. We are off to the races. I am going to architect this example a little differently this time. I am going to create a series of methods as necessary to demonstrate our concepts. I'll call the first one demo one. I'm doing this simply to break up the things that we talk about into methods. I could jam all of this into the main and it would work just fine. I think it might be easier to follow this way. In the main then, I will call that method And then I'm going to go down into the method and start type, typing and talking about arrays. By doing this then, I can write multiple demo methods. They don't get too big. Each one of them can have its own little direction and process. And hopefully that will help just break things up a little bit. In this first demo method, we'll talk about declaring and instantiating. Referring back to the slide again, I can copy those two lines of code from the slide and I can paste them in to that method. Remember from our discussions of scope, we should be able to figure out based on how we're writing this code, what the scope of that variable is. And scope is the range in the program where that variable is recognized, where you can use it. Since, these, since this variable scope is declared inside of the demo1 method, that means the scope of that variable is that method. It doesn't exist anywhere else as far as Java is concerned. I can't reference it up here in the main. I can't do anything with score. I'm going to get an error. So if I tried to say score sub zero equals three, that's not going to fly. The scope of that variable does not extend into the main method. It's limited to the demo method. That's not going to work. So I'll just, you can see that I get an error that says score cannot be resolved to a variable. If you give this program a quick look, you might think, well, in line 11, I have a variable called score. Why am I getting this error? The answer is because it's out of scope in line 7. You just can't do that. I'll get rid of that line because it's annoying and it's wrong and it shouldn't be there. Getting back to the demo method again, my variable called score has been declared. I'll just put a comment here. There's my declaration. 
on the following line there's my instantiation I broke it up into two steps I could have written it in one step let me just put that in here in the form of a comment to complete the thought I could say int score whoops left off the brackets int score equals new int 18 this would be declare and instantiate either way is fine if you're grouping the two lines if you're grouping the two processes together at the same place in the code if you want to declare and instantiate at the same time it's perfectly okay to combine that into one line of programming or just make it into two no, either way is fine it doesn't run any faster it's no more efficient to do it in one line or two if you plan on declaring the variable and then somewhere else down the road instantiating it which happens quite a bit then it's okay to break it up into two lines and put those two lines anywhere where it's syntactically and logically correct to do that now getting back to what I have so far you can see that in line 11 there is a warning the warning the value of local variable score is not used we're not surprised by that because we're not using it it might look like we are using it because in line 12 we are using it but what that error sorry what that warning really means is that you haven't put anything into it yet we declared it instantiated it sure we created a bucket we went to Home Depot when we bought a bucket but we didn't put anything in the bucket the Home Depot doesn't care if you spend all your money on buckets and never put anything in them but Eclipse cares if you create a bucket and never put anything in it or take anything out of it again that's why we have that warning so we're okay with that because pretty soon I know it's getting tense and exciting but pretty soon we're going to put something into that bucket and take it back out we'll get there back to slide five the number one rule that probably causes as much confusion as anything else to a new programmer is the fact that we index from zero we start counting from zero the first element in an array is the zero with element and this is a subject of great entertainment on the programmer humor subreddit if you spend any time on that subreddit you'll see that programmers think it is absolutely hilarious when the index zero shows up in certain situations particularly not related to programming one instance that is somewhat entertaining to all of us the first 500 times we see it is when you go to a restaurant early in the morning you get your receipt you are the zero with customer and we know what that means as developers we know that we start counting from zero it makes perfect sense to us because we've been using arrays to civilians to people who aren't programmers who aren't really computer savvy it looks weird when the first customer in the door is customer zero and sometimes that translates into a piece of paper or a web page that's customer facing causing confusion and, and entertainment when we see it but that's something we all have to get used to arrays index from zero well, let's just put an example in our little method that we're developing I can say score sub zero equals one the golfer got a hole in one on the first hole we can add a comment here this is the first hole in the round of golf 
you don't play golf, that's okay. I don't either. But remember, there are 18 holes, and they are played in a numeric order. The first hole being score sub zero in our case. And I'm not going to argue with you whether it's a shotgun start or some other special case where they might not be playing the first hole <laughs> first in the round. We won't go down that road together. But we're just illustrating that you can start counting from zero. There is no score 18 in this case. If we try to record a score for the sub 18 index, we would read that score sub 18 equals 4. The sub comes from the word subscript, which you may have learned in math, but we're using it now with square brackets rather than writing it as a subscript. So we say score sub 0 equal 1 in line 14 and score sub 18 equals 4 in line 15. This is going to fail miserably and dramatically because there is no sub 18 in this array. There's only 0 through 17. Of course, we'd like to see this fail when we run this code. We get index 18 out of bounds for length 18. That's a great error message. It's telling you that you tried to go beyond the end of the array. You are not allowed to do that. And the type of exception that is thrown is array index out of bounds. Again, very clear what's going on. Eclipse tells you what line of code caused the problem. It provides you a link to click to take you to that line of code. If you've got a program with thousands and thousands or millions of lines of code, that link is invaluable. It takes you right to where the problem was. And it tells you exactly what the problem was. This is a great opportunity to stop, read the error message, mentally process it, and then go fix it. Now in this case, the, the fix is just comment out that miserable, offensive line of code. We can also, in Python, but not in Java, use a negative index. This is incorrect in Java. I'm just showing it to you to contrast it with another language. Python interprets that negative 1 as the last element in the array, which would be sub 17. And that means you don't have to know how many elements are in the array to access the last element. You can just put in a negative 1 and you automatically get the last element in the array. Very helpful doing data processing but not something that Java supports. Let's find out what happens when we run this. There's your error message. Same exception, array index out of bounds. Error message says index minus, minus 1 out of bounds for length 18. That's bad news. And I, I'm actually going to get rid of that. We're starting to have a lot of annoying intentional problems in this method. You're limited in Java to 0 through the length of the array minus 1. In this case, 0 through 17 because there are 18 elements in this array. If you need a data structure that can grow and shrink, arrays are not your choice. Arrays are static in size. This array is declared to be 18 and it cannot get any bigger and it cannot get any smaller. Now we can create a new array and discard this one, but we cannot change the size of this one. And as you study data structures, you need to keep in mind the capabilities of the data structure you're using to make, to make sure that you've chosen the right one. You don't want to spend three months working on a project and then realize, oh, I should not have used arrays to solve that problem. I should have used something else. One of the things that you'll learn as you do more and more coding is that 
there are data structures that are appropriate for certain solutions and data structures not appropriate. At this point, you've used integers to contain information like someone's age or the number of miles between two cities, but you've also used floating point numbers to contain information like someone's salary or the amount they spent at a restaurant or the tax being charged on a purchase. Those are data structures. An integer is a data structure. A float or a double is a data structure. They're just very simple ones, but you've chosen those based on what you need to store in that and what you need to do with it once you've stored it in there. Now you've just got more things to think about. If you'd like even more to think about, here's an excellent book written 40 years ago by a very famous computer scientist who invented two popular computer languages, one of which I used to teach. And it talks about the theory and practice behind selecting a data structure. You do, this is not a requirement. You don't have to run out and buy it today. My birthday isn't until October, so you don't have to get it for me. But if you want to learn more about programming and why we do what we do, this is an excellent book to pick up and study. It's not Java specific. It's not specific to any programming language, as a matter of fact. So it gives you a great introduction to the theory of programming, which helps you understand so much more when you read about a particular language. Oh, that makes sense because theoretically we do this in all types of programming. It's pretty cheap right now. Uh, at the recording of this video, it's $28. And there, apparently the paperback version is not available right now. But you can see that I bought mine over 10 years ago. Highly recommend it if you think you want to be in the programming field. Back to the slides. Slide six. Write a loop to sum the contents of the score array from the previous slide. Let's go back and look at the previous slide because I've already forgotten what was there. Okay, this is going to be good because it's not going to work. The previous slide gave us that variable declaration. And then slide six says, okay, let's sum up the values in that variable. And this is going to be a problem. You may realize it already, but I won't give it away just yet. So let's go back to our code again. And I am already tired of demo one. It's just got too much stuff in it. It's starting to get annoying. So I'm going to comment out line six in my main. I'm not even going to run that demo one method anymore. It's become too much. I'm going to create another method called demo two, and I'm going to put all my code in there. This just gives us a better opportunity to focus on the job at hand rather than fight our way through all that other code. And then in the main, we'll invoke demo two. Hopefully you see where I'm headed, just a little attempt at modularity. Even in a program where we're just demonstrating concepts, uh, the concepts sometimes just get out of hand and we need to break things into little bite-sized pieces. So in demo two, let's paste in the code from I'm not having any luck with PowerPoint here. There we go. Let's paste in the code from line uh, from slide five. We'll just use that as our starting point. Okay. You recognize by now that this is declare and instantiate. Declare and instantiate.
one of the things you want to do to a data structure is process it somehow. And in the case of an integer or a float or a string, that's pretty easy. You just refer to it by name and you can do math on it or you can append things to it if it's a string or print it out or read something into it from the keyboard. Since there are 18 things now that we're dealing with and they're all called score, we need to vary that index to access the individual elements of that array. And the slide says, slide six, write a loop to sum the contents of the score array from the previous slide. Okay. Well, that's something we could probably use as a prompt. Take that command right off the slide and paste it right into our program just so that we kind of know what we're up to. Now, how do you loop through an array? Something that you need to be able to do. Every programmer needs to manipulate the data structures they use and in its simplest form the ability to iterate or step through an array is crucial. This is something you have to commit to memory or you, you'll be looking it up every five minutes and you'll just have a miserable time. So now according to the slide we can use a for loop. The slide is helping us. It's a very helpful slide. And the for loop works conveniently when we're iterating over an array because we know the starting index, which is 0, and the ending index, which is the length of the array minus 1. The for loop works really well because the for loop lets us program in the beginning and the end and the condition, which is going to be stepping through by 1. And that might look something like this, for int i equals 0, i less than 18, i plus plus, curly braces, because we always put loops in curly braces. And then inside, we can say sum plus equal score sub i, notice that we're using i is the, is the loop variable and the array index. How convenient is that? This is standard practice. We created the loop explicitly for the purpose of iterating through the array and then inside the loop we will use the same variable i to manipulate the index of the array. And this logic will run 18 times. In this case the only thing inside the loop is line 13 of my code. That means line 13 will run 18 times and the value of i will cycle through from 0 to 17. And that is iterating through an array. So if I see you at Chipotle and we're standing in line waiting for a luscious burrito and I ask you how to iterate through an array, you could say use a for loop. And then you could say leave me alone because I want to order my burrito now. We still have a problem in our particular loop because I haven't declared sum yet. So let's put sum in here. Int sum equals zero. Now the syntax errors are gone. There's still a problem that Eclipse isn't quite happy with that bucket called sum. I'm using sum to store things, but I'm not pulling anything out of it. I'm filling up my bucket but I'm not emptying my bucket. So let's go down here and let's print. And I'm introducing another error and I'm going to fix it. System.out.println sum equals plus sum. 
Now I'm trying to make Eclipse happy. I'm saying, okay, Mr. Eclipse, I am finally taking something out of that bucket. But Eclipse still isn't happy. It says, sum cannot be resolved to a variable. Oh my word. And that's a scope problem. Remember, the declaration of my variable sum is inside these braces. That means the scope of that variable is limited to those braces. We could also say the scope of that variable is limited to that for loop. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Well, if I want to use it outside of the for loop in line 16, I'm going to have to move it. Let's put it above the for loop. All the errors go away and everybody's happy. This still isn't going to work, however. Let's run this and see what happens. Okay, I get sum equals zero. And the reason for that is because I never put anything into the array. So it's giving me an answer, but the answer really has no value. So it's logically incorrect. Where does the zero come from? It comes from the fact that when you instantiate an array, as I did in line 10, it automatically initializes all of the values. That means score 0 through score 17, score sub 0 through score sub 17 are all 0. And that's why when I add those elements up, 0 plus 0, 18 times, I get 0. Okay. Logically incorrect. Doesn't do what I think it might be doing. So let's put some numbers into this array. How are we going to do that? We could say score sub 0 equals 1. They got a hole in 1. Score sub 1 equals 2. They got 2 on that one. Score sub 3 equals 3. They got a, they got a 3 on the windmill hole. And I could keep on going like that and type in 18 different scores and my fingers would hurt and my eyes would bleed and I'd be bored. There's got to be a better way to initialize that array, right? There is an array way away. That's easier. Let's get rid of our annoying attempt to manually initialize each one. And let's do it this way. Score equals new int square bracket curly brace one comma three and I'm just making up numbers comma one comma two comma three comma three comma four how many is that about eight I just made up a bunch of scores whoops So, instead of instantiating the way I did it in line 10, I'm going to instantiate it using a set of values. That set of values will determine the size of the array and the number or the value of each element in that array. If you just need some quick data, that's the way to do it. We could read it from a file or scrape it off a website or pull it from a database, but that's just a way to get some quick data. I am a little bit concerned that I don't have exactly 18 here because I just went through and counted them mentally as I did it. So I'm going to do this. Watch. I'm going to print the size of the array just to make myself feel better. I'm going to say score has plus. Now how do I determine the length of an array? Okay, this is one more thing that you just need to learn how to do and commit to memory. If you haven't looked it up already, if you didn't read it in the book, score 
dot length that is the property of that array telling us how many elements it has in it the length property now I'm going to run that and hopefully that'll print out 18 but you never know because I may not have counted these things correctly we'll find out together ah I was way off it has 22 elements that's just too many I'm going to get rid of four of those. One, two, three, four. Let's try it now. See if I got 18. I got it. This is just made up data. It doesn't have any meaning in the real world. But now at least I have 18 of them. Now when I did this, Java automatically throws away that first attempt at instantiation in line 10. I'm really instantiating this array twice. And if a professional programmer looked at this, they would have a little conniption because what's going on behind the scenes here is uh, an, an allocation of 18 integers in memory. Then immediately that's discarded and we allocate 18 more integers in memory. So that's not good practice we probably want to we definitely want to eliminate that now we're doing a declaration in line 10 and initialization I'm sorry instantiation and initialization in line 11 and I'll put a comment here I'll say instantiate and Initialize, how about that? Just another syntax for us to use. And if you forget how to do it, you just do a, a web search on Java. How do I initialize an array of integers? You'll find that syntax easy peasy. You're good to go. Notice now that our score I'm sorry, the sum of our scores is no longer 0. It's 53, which is going to be the sum of all of these values right here. We've seen to this point then, declaring, instantiating, initializing, and iterating over a loop. We've learned a whole bunch of neat things over an array, sorry. We need to, we've learned to do a whole bunch of neat things with arrays. This applies to arrays of strings and arrays of doubles and floats and also arrays of complex types like objects that you'll learn how to do in the next class that you take. Let's look at applying our knowledge and writing a method to implement some of this knowledge. I'm bored with demo 2. Let's comment out demo 2. Now our main doesn't do anything. If we run this program, it will do nothing. There's no executable code inside the main method. We've got beautiful methods demo 1 and demo 2, but they never get invoked. And nothing happens when we click the run button just an empty console window this might be a place for eclipse to give us a warning and say hey your main doesn't have any code in it but uh, eclipse doesn't do that so let's write another method let's make this method moderately interesting and useful and i realize that i have a need for a method that sums up all of the elements in an array. I'm doing this over and over and over all day long. Instead of writing this for loop hundreds of times in many different locations, let's modularize our logic that we have in demo 2 so we can call it over and over and over and do fun stuff with it. 
That means this method is going to return an integer, which will be the sum of all the elements in the array. And let's call this sum array. This method will be extremely useful if we can pass the array as a parameter. And we will say here that some array is coming in. My array, that will be our parameter. This method could have originated as an idea in a project meeting that you were in. You were given the job of writing this method and providing it to your team. Or maybe you just noticed that you were using this for loop many, many, many times throughout your code. You realized it was time to modularize that logic. The method, so far so good, but Eclipse is unhappy because we have committed to return an integer. At this point, we are returning zilch, nothing. And that's why we have that error. And that's OK. We're just not there yet. Eclipse gets a little bit antsy if you don't do everything immediately. All right, in our method, we're going to operate on this thing called my array. So I need a for loop. Well, let's let's make our our sum first. There's our sum. We initialize it to zero because we haven't got anything in it yet. And let's write our for loop for int k equals 0, k less than my array dot length, whoops, my array dot length, k plus plus, sum plus equal my array sub k. Finally, to make Eclipse happy and complete this method, we need a return statement which is the sum of our array elements. And that duplicates what we did in demo two. Just looks a little different because the variable names have changed. Remember your Java docs. If you Java doc all the methods that you write except for the main method. So we're going to say sum the contents of an array. The parameter is the array to sum, and it returns the sum. There you go. We have a wonderful, reusable, modular piece of code. I can call it over and over and over without having to rewrite it each time. I used k as my loop variable. I did not use I. You're going to find that most developers use I, J, K, L, M, and N as loop variables. There's a historic reason for that. We, we use I predominantly is our loop variable if we don't if we have not already used i you see me use i 99.9% .9 of the time i just chose to use k in this case to be different just to show you something different the reason we use these letters is because most of the people that wrote the programming books learned a language called fortran and in Fortran, if you started a variable with an I or a J or a K all the way to N, you didn't have to declare it. It was automatically an integer. So everybody that wrote the programming books learned Fortran, and they were already in the habit of using I, J, K, L, M, and N. That's why we still do it. That's our historical tidbit of the day. And the Fortran language... still around today, certainly not as popular as it was 50 years ago, but there is still some Fortran code running. You could probably make a living at it. Uh, 
Let's just take a peek. Monster.com. Will it let us search? This looks like a different interface. I don't care about that. Where do you? Where is your search? Where are you, Monster? I don't see it anywhere. Monster is not cooperating today. Pausing the video. I gave up on Monster. I went to Dice. I searched for the word Fortran. It came up with only 87 jobs, which is kind of sad because if you search for Java, you're going to get probably 100 times that. Anyway, there is still some Fortran out there. Not a lot. It looks like the first two are in California. Virginia. They're probably, for the most part, engineering type jobs requiring a strong math background and probably that you're 100 years old in order to be able to do it. But I just wanted to show you that there is a historical connection, if however weak it is, between modern languages and Fortran because the people that wrote the books learned this language. Enough of that. We have this wonderful method called sum array. Let's work it. Let's make it do something for us. Back in the main method, let's create an array of uh, grades. Sorry, left out the brackets. Grades, and that's going to be new int square bracket curly brace. I got 100, then I got a 90, then I got another 100, then I got a 50 because I didn't read the instructions, then I got another 100. Those are my grades. I can call my method. The method is going to send a number back to me, which is the sum of the array. I need to grab that number and store it somewhere. One way is to use an assignment statement. And since that method returns an integer, I will declare my bucket to be an integer. I'm calling it total here. I could just as easily call it sum because the other sum is a different scope. They don't interfere with each other. But just for semantic difference, I'll call it total. Finally, as we always do, let's print it out. And that's going to be 100 plus, that's 290, 390, 440, I'm predicting. Yay, I got it right. We wrote a method that accepts as a parameter an array of integers. In the method, we iterated over that array, summed all the values, returned that sum from the method. In the main, we captured that return value, stored it in a variable called total, Finally, we printed that total to the console. Let's try to use our method again. In the next attempt, I'm going to do this incorrectly so we can see what happens. And let's say that for a different reason, I will say our array is not integer values. It consists of doubles. And this array will also be grades, math grades. The math teacher grades using floating point numbers. One hundred point five, fifty point five. 40, this class is really hard, 
left out the word new, sorry. And this is perfectly fine. We can have an array of doubles and we can declare, instantiate, and initialize all at the same time. Declare, instantiate, init. I just made up abbreviations for those things. Declare, instantiate, and initialize. But if I try to call this method that I worked so hard to create, I can say sum array. Now here's where it all falls apart. Math grades. The sum array method insists on being given an array of integers. But this is an array of doubles. Eclipse immediately catches the problem and refuses to compile the program. It's another syntax error. And the error says the method sum array in the type main, that, that's the class name, main, is not applicable for the argument double. It's saying that, hey, you have to pass integers or an array of integers to that method. That's not going to fly then. There's just no way around that. Now, we can do some polymorphism. We can rewrite this method, another version of this method, with the same name, but it will process doubles and accept a double parameter. So we can have two methods with the same name as long as they take different parameter lists. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to copy the entire method, including the Java docs. That's just less typing for me. Copy the entire method into the clipboard. Paste it in. Now this causes an immediate problem because now I have two, or two methods with the same name and the same parameter list. The first one, however, I'm going to immediately change to double. And I'm going to make it return a double. The only other change I have to make is to change sum to a double. These two methods now have the same name. They're both called sum array. But they differ by the parameter list. One takes an array of integers as the only parameter. The other takes an array of doubles as the only parameter. This is perfectly fine. We do this all the time. You're supposed to do it this way. It's okay to have two methods with the same name. They do the same thing. They just take different parameters. Now there are other ways to solve this problem as well, but this is an introduction to polymorphism. Now up here, look. I don't have the error anymore on my call to sum array where I pass it the array of doubles. The error went away. It knows which method to call. It knows to call the one that takes an array of doubles as a parameter. Eclipse is, and Java is very smart that way. To complete the thought, we just need a print statement. And that's going to be the sum of these numbers, which I'm not even going to try to predict. It turns out it's 281.5. How about that? We've demonstrated then that we can have two methods with the same name in the same scope as long as they take different parameters. One of our methods takes an array of integers as the parameter. The other method takes an array of doubles as the parameter. They, they're both called sum array. I hope that was interesting. Thank you very much.